Okay, so as I say, it's always a bit impressive for me to uh, give talk in front of all my friends. And, uh, you know, I give a lot of talks, but this is the most difficult talk for me to give, so hopefully I don't mess up. Um, so I'm going to try to relate uh, the, what we do in my lab with uh, the notion of times in development. And actually, I even borrowed a slide from Thomas, not Systemon, and to try to explain what we try to mean by that. Okay, okay so. We try to work on the neural diversity, try to understand how the many neurons that compose our brain are being formed. And those cells come in very many different varieties. So if you want to study that in humans, it's a bit complicated because you know, we have 80 billion neurons in our uh, brain, and um, we have no idea how many cell types there are. In fact, there even people who believe there is no real cell type. It's a continuum from one cell type to the other one. And in spite of many, many studies from, uh, for example, the Allen Institute in Seattle, which had done a lot of sequencing on all the brains, we still don't know whether we have 100 cell type, 1,000 cell type, or 100,000 cell type. I will myself believe, according to what we see in flies, that is more closer to, to, closer to 100,000 cell type. Okay? So we study instead a much simpler organism, which is the fruit flies, and not even the fruit flies, mostly the optic lobe, that means the, the part of the fly, uh, um, fly uh, brain that actually process vision. And the fly is a very, very visual animal, which is most of his brain actually is dedicated to vision. More than two thirds of the neurons in the brain are just for vision. And we have identified, we and other people have identified at least 250 uh, uh, neuron types which are only present in that, and they're very well defined cell type, not any kind of continuum whatsoever. And on top of that, we know the connectome of those neurons, uh, in the sense that we know what each one of those neurons connects to what other neurons in a very precise detail, thanks to the work from Janelia Farm. And in spite of this uh, fact that there's only 60,000 neurons, which is a million times more simple than, 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 a, than a human brain, they can do things that we cannot do. Flying at high speed, acrobatics uh, uh, flying, and, and again, you cannot catch a fly if you try it, okay? And so now we have actually, uh, of course, many, many different tools uh, which are available in flies, a genetic tool for the last 100 years. And of course, now we have also access to single cell genetics, although every other species, including the hippo, actually can, or the, the rhino, can actually do a single cell sequence. Okay. So um, let me give you some introduction in terms of how the system functions. So I'm trying to use this new pointer. So what you have basically is the retina here, okay? And uh, maybe it's easier if I point. Um, so retina is about 800 type of photoreceptor, which means the system is very low resolution, about 800 pixels. And then what you have processing by different uh, layers, different neural peels, okay, whereby those 800, uh, 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 sorry, it's complicated, okay. those, try to, okay. so those 800 uh, uh, pixels are going to be processed by 800 uh, columns in many different layers, this is called the, uh, uh, the lamina, which mostly process vision, and then you're going to go deeper into the brain, into the, uh, the medulla, which I'm going to spend most of my time, which process vision uh, in every sense, color vision, motion vision, object detection, whatever, okay? And then this is going to be processed by higher processing center, very interesting stuff, but uh, we will uh, uh, not have time to talk about this today, okay? So what you have a beautiful retinal organization, which means that we what we call retinotopy, which means that the photoreceptor here are going to project to here, the photoreceptor here are going to project here, which means you have eight, in fact, not one optic lobe, you have 800 processing systems running in parallel to one another. And this makes our life dramatically more simple. And on top of that, what I will try to argue, and maybe try to put some qualifier at the end, that actually the system is designed in a very deterministic manner, which means that everything is planned in the genome. There is no such thing like you know, activity dependent of plasticity. Everything is really well set up in rock from the beginning. Every fry is the same. Okay? So there is a, a, a quite a lot, large number of cell types. So a few cell types, mostly photoreceptor in the eye. This is a very simple structure, the lamina, very interesting, but very simple, only basically detecting you know, uh, on or off uh, motions. And most of the activity is actually on the medulla, where there are at least 100 cell types. And what I'll tell you today is how time is very important for processing those 100 cell types before the information is being sent to higher processing center and to the brain, and this leads to a behavior. Okay? Okay. So in this system here, what you have you have different types of neurons. So if we're focusing on this attention here, you have different types of neurons. You have neurons that process information from one pixel. And for example, you have what you call a mono, uh, uh, unicolumnar neuron. There is one neuron like that for every one of the pixels. Okay? And so here, I try to illustrate that. Here. There is about 800 neurons because there are 800 uh, 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 columns. 
And then you have neurons which are much broader, collect information from neighboring or matidia, or neighboring pixels, and are going to process information. There's not going to be uh, many fewer. And actually, in this case, you know, you have 75 neurons belonging to that, but you have some other processing neurons. There are five of them, the whole brain, and some you have 800 in the whole brain. So a lot of different stoichiometry. So the unique columna are produced at one-to-one -one stoichiometry with a number of columns, and those multi-columna neurons are produced a much lower stoichiometry, which differ from one neuron to the other one. Okay, so now through a lot of uh, uh, genetics over the last many years, we know actually most of those neurons purely based on morphology. This starts with Cajal. Cajal basically looks at the fly, not this fly, but other flies, uh, uh, to basically define all those cell types, and you can really define precisely all the cell types purely based on morphology. With at least one more uh, uh, caveat there is actually, you can say that you, have, you, you never have more, more than one neuron per column, which means if you have two neurons, they look a bit the same, in the, in the same column, it's, unlike, it's likely to be two different neurons, but if you have, uh, um, so basically the maximum will be one neuron per column. So everything is processed in parallel to it. And so of course you have projection neurons that send information to the high brain center, or you have local inter neurons which process information, whatever process means. But more interesting for us, you have to distinguish between those unicolumnar neurons, which are one per column, and those which are uh, multicolumnar, which have one per five or 10 or 100 or 200 or, or per column, okay? So how do you make uh, all those neurons and very precise number in the right number with the right stoichiometry? And I hopefully will give you some answer by the end of the talk, okay? So again, uh, we knew those neurons from a morphological point of view. And of course, when single cell uh, sequencing came out, and lucky we got lucky in our department hired Ralu Satija, who is a king of single cell sequencing with SORAT. So we moved very quickly to uh, using single cell sequencing. And it's actually a very nice uh, uh, TISNI here when it shows all those neurons. It's not only the medulla, it's all the neurons in the optic lobe, okay? But 250 neurons, about 250 clusters. And um, and you can see, if you compare to most of the single cells you might have seen from vertebrate, they're very, very well determined, very cluster, big blobs separated from the other, okay? And also, you can see the size of those clusters varies quite extensively, which makes sense because I told you, you have the unicolumnar neuron, which represent one for each cluster, and those are going to be the big clusters. And then so, which has a uni the multicolumnar neuron, which represent one for five, and they're going to be very different size cluster. And therefore, we can put a name on not all, but many of those clusters. And we've been working very hard to try to put a name to, to uh, connect the morphology with the transcriptome and hopefully at some point be able to use this information to try to understand how the connectome can be built. If you know how 250 neurons connect to each other and you have all the transcriptome, you can be able to figure it out. So far, we haven't managed to do that. Uh, you might see here, there is, for example, here a, a cluster which is much larger. Usually in most of the single cell clusters which are much larger like that is crap. Here is not crap, it's actually eight neurons which are very, very similar type of neurons. The eight neurons that detect motion, four of them detect front to back, back to front, up and down. The other one detects the same thing, but either on a white background, a strap on a white, black strap on a white background, or vice versa. So very well defined neuron. And now we have actually means to differentiate those things. Okay, so now we have all this transcriptome, and it's very nice, but this is adult transcriptome, and I'm a developmental biology, so I don't care about what's happening in the adult. I care much more how those neurons come to be about, okay? So we decided to try to look during development. And of course, during development, the neurons have no shape or form. So it's very hard to match the shape of a neuron with this transcriptome because we don't know what the shape is. But then we say, okay, let's try to go, try to get the uh, adult transcriptome and then try to look earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. And every time, try to divide the screen to identify the neurons just a bit earlier in time to those in the adult and so on and so on. And it works beautifully well. So what you have here, again, those 250 clusters that you have in the adult, Okay, and then you can see those at a 70% of the development, and you can match perfectly one, one to one, all those clusters to the other. And then you can do the same thing at 50% development, all the way to the time where basically they were just born. And therefore, what we have now was a developmental traje trajectory of all the neurons from the time where they were born to the time where they become adult. And there is a lot of interesting features you can see that. And just to notice, you remember this big blob here, which is eight neurons, you can see those eight neurons get very well separated at the time of development because also they do the same thing. They detect motion in one direction. The, the, the connector, will, the way they connect to each other are going to be different and therefore you can see it during the, uh, the earlier development. Okay, this is very nice. And you can see here, you can start at this point to see this long trajectory in the sense you can see the neurons which are maturing. And so the question is, that where does it start? How do those neurons become different from one another? How do you generate all of those type of neurons? Okay. 
So, um, <coughs> okay, so, okay, so uh, let's focus now mostly on, on the medulla part of the optic lobe. And again, you have 800 colons, and you have, again, those uh, uh, neurons that form here. And basically what we can say is that actually each one of the colons is going to be a, a neural network on its own. We want to understand how all those neurons that surround one of the colon is done. And we can do that because 800 times repeated throughout development. Okay? So, um, and this structure is about 100 neurons. About 25 of them are unicoronal, which means that you know, one per colon, and the rest are different stoichiometry uh, between a multi coronal neuron. Okay? okay, so how does this happen? As you might know, the eyes of the fly develop, it's a beautiful work from uh, Jerobin Rubin many, many years ago, where basically it shows that the eye develops, and many other people actually, through a wave of differentiation that cross through this epithelium, a single cell neuroepithelium, and create the 800 omatidia, the 800 type of photoreceptor that forms the eye. And then this sends their projection, and they are going to meet this uh, purple here, neuroepithelium. This neuroepithelium crescent shape is going to give rise to all those neurons from the medulla. Uh, this is a lamina, the other five structure, which is very interesting stuff, but I don't have time to talk about. And we can focus our attention on this neuroepithelium. So first is a neuroepithelium, and then what's going to happen is that the neuroepithelium on the outer edge will become neurostem cells, and we call neurostem cell neuroblasts in flight. Okay, so it'll be confusing. And what's going to happen, those neuroblasts are going to form right at the outer edge of the neuroepithelium, and then over a period of three days, this neuroepithelium will be transformed. That means the neuroblasts will grow, will, will develop, and at the end, the whole neuroepithelium will be consumed by a number of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, of, of neuroblasts, okay? So in a diagrammatic fashion, you have the neuroepithelium here, an outer, uh, at the outer edge of the, um, of the, um, um, <coughs> Of the neuroepithelium, you have this neuroblast, and then as time goes, every maybe two, three hours, you have a new rows of, uh, of neural stem cells or neuroblasts that form, and so on and so on. And uh, at the end, we thought for the longest time, that in fact, this was producing 800 neuroblasts. It was great because you know 800 neuroblasts will be the number of colons, which means very easy. This means actually each neuroblast produce all the neurons for each one of the colon. Okay, it's a bit. Problematic, and I will tell you later on, maybe this number is not totally correct, but you know, this is a very basic concept. Each neuroblast produces all the neurons that, that, that makes uh, some of the colon. Okay? So, in fact, we're going to see that there is many more neuroblasts, and we have to slightly change our model at the end, but it's another story. Okay? Okay. So if you make a cross-section through that, and this is true, whatever, you get to the neuroepithelium here, and then the uh, cell at the outer edge becomes a neuroblast, and neuroblast is a stem cell that does what stem cells do, they divide, they give rise to one intermediate precursor cell. They divide one small for the GMC, produce two neurons, one neuron which is notch on, one neuron which is notch off. Okay? And then two hours later, the next cell will become a neuroblast, produce the GMCs, and divide. But this one also keeps dividing as well. And so very quickly, what you're going to have, a beautiful organized system whereby the whole neuroblast, will be, the whole neuroblast will be consumed by neuroblast. And at one uh, different point, you're going to have you know, those long, uh, uh, colons of young neuroblasts that just got born, and these old neuroblasts they were born some time ago, and they have produced uh, neurons a long time ago. And this neuron here was, produ was produced when the neuroblast was young, the same way as this neuron was produced when this neuroblast was young. Okay? And so this is very well organized, and it keeps very beautiful structure. And if you make a clone here, when you label one neuroblast, you can see this long colon, about 20 neurons that form here that correspond to the product of one of the stem cells. Okay? So, now, the question is, if my proposal is right, this neuroblast produces 20 cells that are all going to be different from one another to be able to produce all the neurons that surround each one of the colon. How can you, one stem cell can produce 20 different type of neurons, okay? And so we didn't know anything about that until about 25 years ago, my colleague Chris Doe and, and O'Donnell have come up with a very nice model, what they call the temporal patterning of neuron stem cell. Very simple. The so neuron express hunchback, the so gene that Thomas uh, talked about uh, for all your, his earlier life in the embryo. And hunchback is a transcription factor. When the cell divides and produces a neuron, it's going to produce a neuron that express hunchback. But then it gets tired of expressing hunchback. It's going to turn off hunchback and turn on crupel. When it divides, it produces a neuron that crupel. And then it gets tired of crupel, PDM, gets tired of PM, it produces castor. So conceptually, it's beautiful because now you have one stem cell that can produce four different types of neurons simply by this transcriptional circuit whereby uh, cast, uh, uh, hunchback, then crupel, and PDM, then castor. Okay? It's very nice. And actually, 25 years ago, people jump on that and said, let's find the same thing in all the structures that we know develop in a temporary manner in vertebrate, for example, the mouse retina, 
or the human cortex, they are all forming in this temporal cell. And so people look for those genes. Nobody found anything similar to that. Michel Cayouette in uh, the mouse uh, um, retina found something a bit, some hint of some of the conservation, but it's not exactly the same story. Okay. And so we say we have a nice system, and you know we are a bit lucky. We are seeing flies, and therefore you can imagine that what you have here in what I just described, that you have young neuroblasts and old neuroblasts in one snapshot. You can do that because they develop in time, and so we should be able to say, you know, hunchback, crippled, epidem, castor. None of those was expressed there. Okay, a bit disappointing, but we find much better because we find the same thing except the name of the gene change, and we have quite a few more. Okay, so now we have young neuroblasts express homothorax then homeo brain and eyeless to repair Daki teles. And now you start being able to produce to have a long temporal series where you can, you can start producing quite a bunch of neurons, okay? And so the question is that, you know, and you have an illustration here, what's happened here is that the neuroepithelium, this has a young, uh, this has a young neuroblast, so this migrating, this is a neuroepithelium, this has a young neuroblast, they express the young, uh, uh, the first transcription factor homothorax, the nihilus repair, and this has the old neuroblast, they express that kit, and if I have enough color on my, on my microscope, I will show you the next temporal window. So you can see here very nicely that in one snapshot, you can see all these temporal windows, and of course, those are young, but those young are also going to be old one day. Okay, so anyway, so how does this system function? Okay, this is still a very simple system. You know, uh, I'm going to give you a few more of the transcription factor. The rule is very simple. If you have the gene so prepared, for example, if you remove so prepared, the temporal series, the, the division will keep going, but all the neurons will be stuck into the previous temporal series. It will be stuck into the eyeless temporal window. Which means what happens is likely that the gene X, so people activate the next one, back it, and repress the previous one, either. So again, as uh, Thomas was uh, mentioning, this seems to be a purely transcription network, which means is you know, just a few transcription factors acting with each other and try to basically have some sort of a timing which depends simply on the time it takes for this, uh, uh, this uh, transcription network to progress. Okay? And, you know, and for the longest time, we believe actually this timing, which it takes a bit, you know, by the time you do trans transcription, translation, and then you repress, it might take maybe an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, which is about the time of the cell cycle. So we thought for the longest time that cell cycle was coordinated with that, which means every neuroblast will go through each one of those temporal series and will produce a neuron which is different at each temporal. But this is only five neurons, and we need to produce at least 20, so how can we go from five to 20 using the same basic principle, okay? So those, those uh, 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 neuroblasts are producing neurons. Actually, this is actually just below the neuroblast, it's actually a staining, which uh, uh, is basically the neurons which are produced uh, by those neuroblasts. And I'll show you this picture just to uh, compare very closely with what happened in the human co or the mouse cortex. By the mouse cortex, what you have, you know, the, the, the radial glia here at the base are forming layer six and layer five, four, three, two, in the correct order, I meaning the first six and five and fourth and three. And Simone Penmeyer and Songhai Shi has shown beautifully well through this modern clone that we, indeed a single uh, new, uh, red glia produced a neuron in layer six, one layer five, four, three, two, which means the same neural stem cell as in our case produce those different types of layers. Again, a lot more complexity exists here because there's not one type of neuron in layer five, and mostly there are a bunch of them. We might not address this question right now today, okay? So a lot of similarity between this picture that I showed you before and this picture here, whereby a single neural stem cell can produce multiple types of neurons. Here is an N25, but we can actually try to do better in the foot file, okay? Okay, so now if you look at this picture that I showed you, it's a beautiful picture, but you know, there is still some gaps. There is some black neurons where there is nothing in it, which means most likely we fail to identify the transcription factor was expressed there. And indeed, this was just done from ad hoc, you know, finding what we have in a freezer and having a good note saying that this transcription factor antibody should work. So obviously we are missing some transcription factor and we cannot ignore that. So how can we identify in a systematic manner all the transcription factor which are going to be expressed into those, those cells here, okay? So Nikos, who is now actually a professor at the Institut Jacques Monod in Paris, they tried to do the single cell sequencing, but not in the other, at the time of development when all those neurons are being born, okay? And so it's not as nice as we had before, but actually you can see this contains a lot of information. So what you can see first is that there are some neuroblasts, so you can identify the neuroblasts, which are here. I'm going to focus my attention on that. Then you have these intermediate precursor cells that are basically dividing once more. And then you have this long trajectory with the neurons, and the neurons are going to be developing because they are just forming, they're just differentiating. And if you now match this to what we had later on in development when the neuron are mature, you can see that basically along at the end of each trajectory, you can find the mature neuron here. 
So we're basically what we have here, from the time the neuron come, is born from the neuroblast all the way to the time it's mature and being able to function, you can follow the trajectory and know exactly what is exactly the transcriptome change this way. Okay? But let's forget about that and only focus on the, the neural stem cell, the neuroblasts which are here. And you can see already from here, this is actually quite some structure already in terms of the human. And at the, I found this picture here, and so the two pictures are the same one with different, you know, quite amazing because it's actually a UMAP, okay, which means totally computer-generated stuff, and each one's totally artificial, and to me this resembles exactly what you see here. What you have here is that, you know, you can see that you can see the different neuroblasts, some express homothorax and ILS, stobiper, dachy, teles, exact same way as you see here. Homothorax, ILS, stobiper, dachy, teles. That means, you know, the computer gives us back exactly what you have, what you expected from that, but on top of that, it tells you, it's going to be able to tell you what happened in those black neuroblasts here, so they don't have any transcription factor expressed. And so basically, what Tikos did, he just built, you know, a, a, a series of pseudo time when you can see genes that go up and down, up and down, and up and down, and you can have the whole long series of those genes here that follow exactly the rules that this thing. And then we test all of those genes. So those genes do act as expected. For the most part, gene X activate gene plus X plus one and repress gene X minus one, okay? So now we can organize them into a temporal series whereby all these rules, they are a bit more complicated than simply gene X activate gene X plus one and minus, uh, repressed minus one. But you know, overall, it's a very long structure which allows you to see that we, you can now define quite a number of neurons that you want to define. Because you know, if indeed gene X activate gene X plus one and repress gene X minus one, that means those three genes X, X plus one, X minus one, do overlap at some point with each other. And you can see here in a picture just with the four uh, uh, genes I first started with, you can see here you have homothorax, homothorax plus ILS, ILS alone, ILS plus Toby pair, Toby pair alone, Dakit. And again, added another six or seven other genes into this series, which means you can now see how many combinations, not one transcription factor, but multiple transcription factors, are going to be able to specify multiple temporal windows. And so it's actually a minimum of temporal windows we can detect simply by immunostainings. You can see like a dozen temporal windows that allow you to basically define at least 20, 20, 20 neurons. I'm a bit short from the 100 I want to define, so how do I go from 12 to quite a lot more? So first thing which is fairly easy is actually, as I told you, those neuroblasts, when they divide, they give rise to an intermediate precursor, what they call a GMC, they divide once more to give rise to two neurons, one notch on and one notch off, which means it's not 12 temporal windows that you have, you have 12 temporal windows indeed, but you produce 24 neurons because there is one for each neuron notch on and notch off, okay? Um, oops. Okay, this is actually a picture that I showed from uh, 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 Thomas, because what you have here, exactly, you know, again, we have a transcription control here, and here, you know, he was trying to contrast the fact, you know, the transcription control is a different timing than the overall developmental stage. But in, in this case here, in our case, you know, this uh, takes about an hour, two hours, and basically the time at which those neurons are being formed to each other, okay? So try to see indeed that now time is really coordinated with the development and is basically part of development, okay? Okay, so now the, we produce 24 cell types. Again, it's short from uh, uh, 100 cell types. How can we solve this issue? Actually, the solution came when we look at the neuroepithelium. So neuroepithelium form, and I told you that all the neuroepithelium form neuroblasts, they all go through the same temporal series, and it's true. However, the neuroepithelial cells are not all the same. This is a crescent-shaped neuroepithelium, and the center is, for, is labeled by VSX, then the middle is by optics, the tip by Rx, and actually, we can even define the dorsal part, so this is the dorsal part and the ventral part, labeled by two different transcription factors, which means you can at least define, in this case, six special domains where neuroblasts are going to emerge from and they're all going to undergo the very same temporal series from the, same, from the different domain of expression. But in fact, although they undergo the very same temporal series, they don't produce the same type of neurons. Depending on of where they come from, they're going to produce two neurons, one notch on neuron, which for the most part, not an absolute value, but for the most part, becomes independent of where they come from. That means they don't care. They're going to produce a unique columnar neurons, Okay, 800 of them because all neuroblasts will produce a neuron stem cells, a neuron, neuron that is everywhere. And, but those coming from here, from the dorsal VSX, will produce some other neurons which are not off. And therefore, now you can multiply everything by six. So 12 multiplied by two, 24 multiplied by six, and now you have enough neurons that you can produce to explain all the production of all those neurons that I find. There. Okay. So, and again, I can show you some illustration to show that here is actually just one temporal window, the earlier temporal window, this temporal window produces a unique columnar neuron called 
MI1, you know, unique neuron, very thing. And it's produced by all the neuroblasts throughout the neuroepithelium. But VS, uh, the VSX domain produces a, a multi much larger receptor field, only from this domain, which means it's produced at lower amount, lower numbers, because you know, it's only coming from a small domain. It still innervates the whole uh, uh, visual uh, field, but it's only produced from a small domain in a smaller quantity. And therefore, depending on the size of the domain where they come from, they're going to produce different neurons at different stoichiometry. Okay? And actually, here is a compilation of some of the variety of neurons. You can see the different domain where they come from, and it tells you that basically it roughly corresponds to the number of neurons that are being produced, basically set up the stoichiometry. So now, what I just told you here is that uh, basically one neuroblast produces two types of neurons. Those are unicolumnar, and they don't care where they come from. Those are multicolumnar, they care where they come from, depending on which special domain they are from. And this would work very well if indeed you have 800 neuroblasts. But then we went back to the, uh, uh, the, the bench, and we have actually a picture here where you have the neuroepithelium in a, in a neuron development. And you can see here, you have the neuroepithelium with the small, tiny cells, and then a big neuroblast that forms on the outside. And basically, this progress that way, that means at some point, the whole neuroepithelium will be uh, uh, transformed into a neuro stem cell. And we start counting that, we find that there is a lot more tetra neuroblasts, a lot more, maybe 2,000 neuroblasts. So this doesn't fit anymore with my model. And so we say, what's going on, Claude? Are you wrong or whatsoever? So we say, let's try to see what's going on. And so again, it's neuroblast, more neuroblasts than you have colon cell. So it means that not all neuroblasts can produce all of the stems of the cells. We could imagine it would be producing cells and then the cell die, but we don't have enough cell deaths that you cannot uh, help explaining that. So we came out with a model which is actually slightly different uh, modified version of what I just told you. Same, you know, series of temporal window. And this temporal window is going to tick based purely on the transcription network. Okay? And let me decide, you know, you can actually figure out that you can extend or shorten the length of the temporal window simply by changing the properties of activation of repression. That means some temporal will be very short, some will be very long, depending how the circuit functions, how fast the repression occurs, how stable the protein is. Okay, so you have long temporal windows, you have short temporal windows, and that means it's going to tick, 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 independently from anything, just independent, depending on, 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 the, on the transcription network. But then on top of that, you're going to have cell cycle. And cell cycle only depends on totally different criteria. Simply, the cell divides, it loses one third of its weight because the cell is produced, and then you have to regrow again before it can divide again a second time. And this is going to depend. And if the cell, since the net cells are not synchronous, sometimes the cell cycle can be slower than the ticking of the temporal clock, which means sometimes you have a cell cycle here, you produce this neuron, this neuron, this neuron, this neuron. But another neuroblast, you will take this one, this one, this one, you produce a different type of neuron, and sometimes you produce another type of neuron. Which means now you can explain why you can have more than 800 neuroblasts. You have 2,000 neuroblasts, because not all of them are going to produce all of the neurons. It will simply depend on this stochastic event whereby you, you lack the synchronization between cell cycle and temporal, and temporal window, and therefore you can produce quite a large number of neurons in different stoichiometry simply by changing the length of the temporal window, which means when the, chance that the, the, the cell cycle will hit. So we are very excited to try to take this model and try to figure out what's happened there. Okay. So this is very nice. You know, we seem to have a very deep understanding of what's going on there. I think it's quite unique in Tamuido because, again, the idea is that it, uh, everything is really set up in rock. And I mean, there's maybe this stochastic version here, but it's just a small tweak on the system. And so the question is, you know, how does the system evolve? And how can you evolve the system, for example, to adapt the, environment, the, the animal to the environment? And this actually is the work that uh, uh, Nikos Konstantinidis is doing at uh, Institut Jacques Monod to try to figure out how the system evolves. But to some extent, I do believe there is a lot of conservation of the system. For example, Muska, the house flies, which diverged from Rodophila about 80 million, 100 million years ago, it has a very, very similar type of system, very, very similar. You know, it seems that you know, evolution has, 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 has obtained the, the, the pinnacle of, of development. You cannot do much better than that okay, with the systems that you have. So we said to try to see what can we look in evolution to see whether we can find things that vary quite a lot more than this optic law. Because you know, flying high speed takes a lot of energy and a lot of, of very sophisticated uh, system. And therefore, maybe it's not going to evolve fast enough. So we focus our attention on a different structure in, in the brain of the flies, which is also a very important structure. It's called the mushroom body. And the mushroom body is a much simpler structure than the optic law. It's only composed of seven cell types. And again, uh, and it's, uh, 
it's basically where uh, memory and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and learning is occurring. So it's a fairly important structure. And uh, we know quite a bit about that. And something very interesting is that it's composed of 2,000 neurons. But those 2,000 neurons come only from four neuroblasts. If you divide 2,000 by four, that means each neuroblast produces 500 neurons. One stem cell produces 500 neurons, okay? Which means it undergoes, uh, because there is a, still a notch division, is that means it has to undergo 250 division. Even a division takes an hour, you make 250 hours, this is longer than the life of the larval life of an embryo, of a fly embryo. So that means the, uh, uh, the system is working. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, so the question, we know how the system functions. So neuroblasts produce first a gamma, gamma one cell types. It divides 50, 85 divisions to produce uh, some gamma and some gamma two. Then it's going to produce 40 divisions for alpha prime, beta prime one, alpha beta two. And then for uh, uh, 125 divisions, it's going to produce the last three cell types. So now we produce 125 cell types to 250 divisions. Okay? Now, how does the system evolve? So for totally different reasons, because we're interested in aging, we also have in a lab a zoo, not a, 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 a rhino, but we have actually ants in the lab, okay? And so um, the ants are very smart animals, they're social animals, and they uh, are going to, uh, as compared to the flies, have about the same size brain, but they will have a lot more on olfaction, which is what the, uh, the, 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 optical, the, the motion body is for, because you know, they communicate with each other in the dark through pheromone, and therefore they have an amazing olfactory system here. Okay? And as a consequence of that, in that case, it's a quote from Charles Darwin, so the people who work on human, you know, take note of that. Okay? Darwin knew what he was talking about. Okay? Okay. So the motion body of the fly, of the ant, is much, much larger. It contains 100,000 euros instead of 2,000 in flies, and it, comp it represents 30% of the brain of, a, of an ant as compared to the, uh, the brain of, of, a, of a flies. Again, ants are much smarter and they do a lot of social stuff, which means it's very important. So this is actually a single cell sequencing of the fly mushroom body, and you can see the seven cell types I described, the two, uh, uh, um, uh, the two gamma, the two alpha prime, beta prime, the three alpha beta. Okay. So we can distinguish them very well in, in the flies. And so although we cannot do too much in ants because it's a difficult system to work with, we can do single cell sequencing. And so here it's the whole brain of an ant, and you can see through markers, it's actually the mushroom body cells here. And now what you can do, take those subsets of cells and actually to do some single cell sequencing on that. And now we find something quite different because instead of the seven cell type we find in the flies, we saw a 16 cell type, but we can have the two gamma, the two alpha prime, beta prime, but a much longer series of alpha, beta in the, in the ant. So we say, what's going on there? How come the ant has so many cell types? And still, it contains the earlier cell types, but it has expanded much larger, much longer, the, the, longer cell, the, the later cell type. And so we said, what's going on there? So we did at least some, uh, in, so we can do in situ, and so we can try to see which cells are produced first and which are produced last. And actually, in this here, we can see that these early born, then middle born, and then even in this temporal series here, you can see that born earlier than those series here, okay? So in fact, what we can see is that at least there is a, 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 a series whereby you know, the early uh, uh, neurons are born here, and then the late neurons are born here. And so what it means, in fact, that uh, for some reason, the temporal series in ants continue much longer than the temporal series in fruit flies. And the reason for that, you remember, the fruit flies had to make 250 division in 10 days. There is no time to make another more cell division. Ants take much longer. They take months to develop. And therefore, they have a lot more time to be able to develop. And as a consequence, we believe that the way the lineage expansion occurs, the, the way you create more neurons before the neurons get killed, it could be that you, know, you can intercalate some step in between. It doesn't have to be the case. It could be that you have multiple neuroblasts that produce different types of neurons. Instead, it seems that actually the same neuroblast stays there, but it stays alive much stronger and then keep producing a temporary theory which was most likely hidden in the flies and now is being revealed because the time of development is expanded. So of course, we're doing an experiment which hopefully might work, is not sure it will work, basically to prevent the neuroblast from dying in fruit fly to see whether you can expand the lineage and see basically a mushroom body from ants developing in the context of the fruit flies. Anyway, so these are fun, uh, you know, we, have, uh, we love our little ants. And so I want to give uh, credit to the people who have done the lab. Uh, oops, 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 what's going on? Um, 
Oh, I hate to listen. I didn't, I didn't intend to talk about that, so. Okay, so these are Nikos and uh, Isabel, who are going to be both in Paris very soon. And Nikos is in Paris already. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, um, Neshet, who is uh, taking a position at the, <coughs> in, in Kansas City, and then uh, um, at the Stowers. And then Felix, actually in Paris, is also going to join Nikos Lab, so my lab is being duplicated in, in Paris. And then uh, uh, Bogdan is my ant person, who is an amazing guy who is actually doing all the work on the domain. Thank you very much. And actually, this ant project is done in collaboration with Daniel Randberg, who is a Mr. Epigenetics, and actually, there's been a very prolific uh, pro pro uh, collaboration with him. Okay. Those are the people who basically I didn't talk about. Okay. Thank you.